My name is Rosie Goldsmith and welcome to my riveting interview series, Conversations with Authors from All Over the World. My nickname is Rosie the Riveter and one of my great passions is introducing readers to riveting writers. You may already know The Riveter, our magazine of international writing, as well as our online riveting reviews and riveting reads. They're all dedicated to giving foreign writers in English translation the prominence they deserve which is exactly what I want to do with this series of riveting audio and video interviews. They're all free via our website, eurolitnetwork.com. Welcome to today's riveting author. Now, Pascal Kramer, who you see here, is a Swiss French novelist. She's a very widely read and published French fiction writer, and she's been garlanded with prizes. Now, Pascal has 14 books to her name, translated into many languages, but as is the way of our English-speaking world, too few of her wonderful novels have been published in English, but we are going to change that. Now, welcome again, Pascal. You're in France, you're in Paris, I'm in Wiltshire in England, um, and because of the pandemic, we're in two different countries, but um, we'll try and make this as warm and friendly and intimate as is possible. So there you are in Paris, you're in France, and you're Swiss, Swiss French. You were born in Switzerland, in the French part of Switzerland, in Geneva. Yeah. And then you studied in Lausanne and you lived in Lausanne. And then uh, you started writing, published your first book in 1982, if I've done my research properly. Yeah. And then you moved to France. Mm -hmm. Now, what made a Swiss-French young woman move to France? What was the reason you moved? Well, so it's more like by chance. And actually between Lausanne and, and uh, Paris, I, I lived in Zurich for six years. Um, and you know, when you are a French writing author, you definitely want to be in Paris, at least at my time. I guess the new writers are no, no more the same and they, they, they are proud to be Swiss and, uh, and they have a good publisher in Swiss. So, but for me, really French literature, it was Paris. So I badly wanted to be there. And so I, I worked in Zurich in an advertisement agency, a French group. So I had the opportunity to, to go to Paris and uh, I stayed there. So it was advertising, it was work, yeah. it was a job that took you to France, um, but also publishing. And it is interesting that um, you, like so many authors, Swiss authors who write in French, went to France because that's where you felt you had to be to write and to be published. Why is that? In the, in the 1980s, was there no one publishing French literature in France? In Switzerland, sorry? Yes, we had some publisher, but not so much. And actually, the problem is when you publish in, in Switzerland at this time again, because now it has changed. Uh, you had no reviews in, in France, uh, you know, you would no, have no cells in France. So, yeah, and, uh, you know, we needed to be validated by Paris. I'm ashamed for that. It, it was like it was. I definitely needed to be validated by Paris. And you say it's changed today. How has it changed today for Swiss French writers? Well, the Swiss uh, French writer feel more proud to be Swiss. And uh, we have a very good publisher now. We have the, uh, Zoe. And Zoe is a very good publishing company. And uh, she did a wonderful work to be, you know, to, to have her books uh, sold in, in France. And, uh, and she has, she's a very, very good publisher. So yes, definitely now the young, young, youngest generation is much more comfortable with the fact they are Swiss. And, and I, I admire them. How do you feel about Switzerland today? Do you still have contact with Switzerland? Yes, actually, my family is uh, in Switzerland. My two very best friends are in Switzerland. And um, yeah, and, and I am Swiss. Uh, you know, I, I have the French pass, passport now. So my life is in Paris and I love Paris. I, li I, li I like the big city. So I, I don't think I would ever go back to Switzerland to, for, for, for leaving, for, to leave. 
I live a French life, but I know that my soul remains what I, what I am, a Swiss person. Now, Pascal, let's talk about your, your, your writing, which, which is, of course, um, also why we're here. But you have got another life. You've always done other things. You've been in advertising. Um, you, I know you started writing fiction at, at, at a young age, but you've done many other things. You've run festivals and, cha- and you work in charities. You work in the mm-hmm. shelter and the homeless shelter as you're doing now. Um, are these other aspects of your life, are they, or do they complement your writing or are they very separate for you? I need to do, uh, I, I could never do only writing. I need these other lives to feed me. And um, so um, the writing, the writing I do professionally is completely different as my writing as an author. So I don't think it helps or it has any influences. It's really completely separate. But I need, and especially now, I work for a lot of non-profit organizations. And so they feed me also with um, what I need as a citizen to to be part of of life of our society uh, to to help if I can so uh, yeah I need this I I need these different lives and uh, now I would like love to slow down a, a little bit as part of my uh, job uh, for for my living and have more time for my writing. But I know also that I like this pressure. I have no, not so much time to write, so I have to steal some you know, time in my days to, to, for my writing. And I, I think that this, tension, this pressure is very helpful for me. You have nevertheless written a lot. I mean, 14 novels is a, you know, it's a lot and they've all been published and done well. And um, I want to talk about this particular time just a, a couple of years ago um, when you won this wonderful Swiss prize, um, mm-hmm. the Grand Prix Suisse de Literature. Mm-hmm. And it was awarded for the whole body of your work, which yeah. is an extraordinary and wonderful thing. So all the novels you've written. And I have got here the quote that the, um, that the Swiss Federal Office of Culture gave when they awarded you this prize because I think it really does describe your writing for me as well uh, that you tell the fate of simple people who've often lost hope and that your writing is precise and sumptuous a song of emotion isn't that beautiful a song of emotion but with a great lucidity about the humanity of simple people Pascal what did it mean to you to win this prize and to be awarded this prize from your, your, own, your home country, from Switzerland? It was very, very important to me because my uh, pr- book, last book didn't, um, wasn't successful at all. And I, I had a lot of doubt and it was really a difficult period of time for me. And suddenly to got this really huge award and for my all body of work it was really very important because you know sometimes you have the feeling okay I have written 14 books but it goes fast and they disappear and uh, and suddenly I, I was like okay uh, I said before I need sometimes to be validated and I, I it validated my work it validated me as an author and at this period of time especially it was really really important to me and uh, it, it made me feel more comfortable um, you always need to be uncomfortable as a writer because if not you're you're not pushed to do to try to do always better but uh, you need a certain um, self-confidence and it definitely give me this self-confidence so it was really important to me we need your writing particularly now because you're so engaged your writing is very engagé mm. do you think that's a fair enough description of your of your fiction well engagé definitely is a good uh, word for my uh, for my reading i really never try to pet my readers i want to be lucid to be very accurate on our and i i'm my my most best interest writing is to really try to understand 
other people and in their way we we have many soul in our head and uh, i i like this many souls we are we have all uh, feelings in ourselves and uh, we are very ambivalent sometimes and that's all this uh, that i want to describe and to to talk about and um Yes, and I try to be really not a uh, lot of people also uh, describe my work as dark, but for me, life is <clears throat> it's not uh, it, it is dark. We, we experience a lot of very dark situations and um, and I, I don't make them darker than they are. I just try to make them really like they are. And with this brutality, life is, can be very brutal. And uh, so I try also to show this brutality. Are you writing a lockdown novel? No. <laughs> no, I never write on a very... It's never uh, autobiographic, uh, but I use things from from my experiences of course so maybe something will come out in 10 years i don't know <laughs> but not immediately but i wrote a longer article for our journal uh, not from my lockdown but from the solidarity uh, that we need and uh, and yeah so do you think I, do you think it's a bad or difficult time for people to write fiction at the moment I don't think, no. Uh, I know that all my friend writer had a difficult time to write. Uh, nobody could really say why, but everybody experienced the same. Um, and uh, we had a lot, a lot of uh, author who uh, wrote about their lockdown. And at the end it was, you know, you, you are, there is no, nothing more to say about this lockdown because so many people has expressed themselves worldwide. So I don't think it's going to be easy to write something new about this lockdown. So better not. I won't. I won't try. Tell us in more detail about autopsy of a father. Now, you said this wasn't particularly successful as far as sales go, but it is an absolutely magnificent, amazing novel. And I mean, I think it should be way up there. I know you've been compared with Nadine Gordimer and so on too. It is an incredible novel. And I think it has even more relevance and topicality today. So it was published in 2017, already very topical then, but today with everything that's going on, Black Lives Matter, the racism, the, the rise of the far right and so on too. I mean, it's just so powerful. Um, tell us what, tell us the story of this novel. What's the, tell us about the people in it and what you were trying to do with this particular work. Yeah, you're right when you say uh, it's much more, even more accurate today, definitely. Um, when I wrote this book, it took me a longer time than uh, for the other books because it's my one of my first books where there is a political background. And it was difficult because I didn't want to make an essay. Uh, I didn't want, I, I shouldn't uh, show what I think myself and how I feel with, with all this. And so I finally find the way it's to tell a family story of a daughter and father, but the father is, became very unpopular. He was a um, very non-journalist, radio journalist, more like left party with a lot of friends uh, among the artists and uh, political and so on. And uh, suddenly he, he defends uh, two young guys in the village where he lived. Um, who have killed a black guy for no reason. And uh, he take, um, he prend par parti, he take parti for, for this two he young takes, guys. He takes the side of the two young white guys. Yeah. So this is Gabriel, the father of the, uh, of the title. And he was a, a very well-known left-wing intellectual and journalist. And then he changes suddenly and he uh, becomes xenophobic, racist even. And he defends two young white guys in the village 
uh, who allegedly killed yeah. uh, a black guy. So this is an incredible turning point in the novel. So uh, finally, Pascal, let's talk about your most recent novel, Une Famille, uh, A Family. It's in French. We haven't yet um, translated or published it in English, but I have read it in French. Um, and it's an outstanding novel. Uh, and I hope very soon everybody will be able to read it. The title is A Family, but it is in fact about how all the different members of one family see one character in this novel, Romain. Tell us the story and what you, what you wanted to show with this wonderful novel. Well, I, I had the opportunity to know from very close uh, somebody who has this very strong alcoholic uh, problem, self-destruction really with alcohol. And uh, it was a wonderful guy. Uh, I met him when he was, he had stopped drinking and uh, but I knew also how difficult it was for him to, uh, to stay away from alcohol. And uh, he was 40 and I was like, what is going to be his life if he has to struggle every day the 40 next years? So I was very moved by his situation and I wanted to show this because, you know, very often people believe uh, alcoholics are well, they do, Never mind, they just had yeah. to stop, yeah. but it's a disease. Yeah. It's a horrible disease. So I wanted to talk about this and I didn't want, I made the moral uh, choice not to uh, write from his point of view because who I am to pretend to know what it is to be, to, to have this hor horrible disease. You, you felt you, you couldn't possibly write it from his viewpoint which is why you then wrote it from five other viewpoints of the family. Yeah, I, maybe if I would have tried, I, I could, but uh, I, I didn't want, it was really a moral uh, statement not to write from his point of view. So I think I, I will take the father uh, as a main character, so as a character who, who, through who the story is told. So I took the father point of view and uh, the father is a um, very good man, Catholic, tall guy who had a big career, and, uh, but who is shy and tender. I, I like this character of the father who is not, uh, you know, just a bourgeois, very strict and uh, severe. It's really a nice character. And so I started to write the book from his point of view and to see this alcoholic uh, situation through his point of view. And at the end of the first chapter, the young sister arrived from Barcelona. And suddenly I think, why do I not to write the second chapter from her point of view? And after this, I realized that's very interesting to have all everybody point of view because everybody has, a, of course, another way to feel with this situation. So then I, I took the brother and, um, and then I realized I'm telling the story of a family. I'm not telling a story of an alcoholic. And so I kept going this way. And so we have five chapter, one from point of view of the mother of the two other uh, sisters. And, um, and it, so it is, and it is really how this, when you have in a family this very dark point, you know, that everybody think about this, he's never really there in the story, but he, he, he exists and he's always there through everybody's feeling and uh, thought because it's a huge problem. And I realize, and it calls uh, une famille, so it's like, it's not the family, but one family. And for me, it's really, I realized after this book came out that everybody, every family has a Romain somehow. You know, somebody who, who is depressed or somebody who had a very other cancer, I don't know. So somebody, with a problem for everybody. Almost in all families, it's like this. And um, so probably it's also the reason why people really f had a strong emotion reading this book because everybody found himself somehow in this story, I guess. 
now we have this um, wonderful novel here, Une Famille, um, A Family, and uh, Pascal Kramer is going to read a very short passage for us. Thank you, Pascal. It's from the point of view of the uh, father and uh, when he uh, met his, his new, his wife, and she has this five years old kid who is not an alcoholic now. Il avait tout juste cinq ans. C'était un gamin facile, très curieux, patient, qui avait tout de suite fait à Olivier le cadeau inattendu d'une véritable amitié. Chaque soir, après le dîner, il venait trouver dans, le trouver dans son bureau. Olivier accordait tout le sérieux possible à ses visites déroutantes. Romain restait parfois simplement là, à regarder autour de lui, assis sur une chaise, le dos rond et les bras emmêlés. Il avait le même profil, les mêmes narines délicates que sa mère et une maigreur acrobate qui le faisait paraître remuant dans ses vêtements. Son expression à la fois absente et posée était un enchantement, un étonnement. Il ne restait jamais très longtemps, ne s'attendait pas forcément à ce qu'il se parle. Parfois aussi, il venait confier des soucis, des incidents de rien du tout, dont Olivier percevait la gravité pour lui, mais sans bien la comprendre. De soudaines difficultés scolaires leur avaient fait craindre un temps qu'ils puissent être raquettés ou du moins malmenés par les, par les plus grands. Olivier s'était alors organisé pour passer le prendre à l'école pendant tout un mois, sans se douter que Romain en serait très heureux. C'était une découverte de le voir parmi les enfants de son âge, ballotté dans la bousculade, rêveur et toujours dans les derniers à sortir. Romain semblait surpris à chaque fois qu'il soit là, Malgré ses dix ans, il venait lui prendre la main. Olivier avait vu une sorte de compassion pour ce père incongru parmi les nounous et les toutes jeunes mamans. Pascal Kramer, thank you so much for this riveting interview. Thank you very, very much. De tout mon cœur. C'était très, très gentil. Merci. Thank you to today's riveting author. My name is Rosie Goldsmith and thank you for watching and listening to our riveting interview, conversations with authors from all over the world. You can find our riveting interviews, reads and reviews on our website, eurolitnetwork.com.